life can bring us storms. Those moments where we wander, wonder, doubt. The journey doesn't stop, but the progress does. It can be lonely, painful. Sometimes we try to stare it down, as if we can somehow will it to go away. Or we think we can go toe to toe and come out the other side, unscathed. We often forget just how small we are. The truth is, storms are inevitable. But when they appear, we have a protector, a savior who knows a thing or two about calming storms. A God who is a stronghold in times of trouble. In our weakness, He is strong. In our fear, He is courage. In our desperation, He is peace. Yes, storms are inevitable. But our God is invincible. Good morning and welcome to Hope Baptist Church online on this Sunday morning. It's so good to be with you. It's so good to welcome you as we come and we gather together for church. If this is your first time tuning in to Hope, I want to give you a special warm welcome this morning. My name's Luke. I'm the pastor of the church here. And we come together to worship an awesome, a holy, a magnificent, a majestic God. You know, We're in the midst of a lot of storms at the moment, aren't we, with everything which is going on in the world. And as we come to worship today, it can be easy to come in here with the weight of the world on our shoulders uh, and, and really not wanting to engage in worship and praise. But I'm reminded of the story of Job this morning. If you don't know the story, Job was a man who seemingly had everything and yet in the blink of an eye lost everything. And what was Job's response in the midst of his hurt, in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his struggles? He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. You see, turning our eyes upon Jesus, focusing once again on who he is, the magnificent, the majesty, the splendor and the glory of God puts everything into perspective. So I don't know how you're feeling today. and I don't know what's going on in your life right now. But my encouragement to you as we come to worship God today is to once again focus on him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's pray together. I'm going to hand over to the band. They're going to lead us in worship together today. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather. It's still not the way that we would like to be gathering. We would love to be together here in this building as family, singing your praises at the top of our voice. But Lord, we thank you for the ability to still gather. We thank you for the ability to still be church together. And our heart's desire today, Father God, is that we meet with you. Lord, in our homes, wherever we're watching this today, may your voice be prevalent above the storms, above everything which is going on, above the uncertainty, above worry, above fear. May we hear the voice of King Jesus in our life today. Come, Holy Spirit, meet with your gathered people today. Encourage us and spur us on. Lord, we are here. Speak. Your servants are listening. Let's worship God together. Let's say hello to one another in the chat as well. Let's remind each other that we're here and that we're family together. But most of all, let's lift up the name of King Jesus today. Let's worship him.
seated on a throne and the train of his robe filled the temple above him were seraphim each with six wings with two they covered their face with two they covered their feet and with two they were flying and they were calling to one another holy 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 is the lord almighty the whole earth is filled with his glory at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hands that he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. 
Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. How awesome. How majestic. How mighty. How marvelous is the God that we worship. I want to encourage you today to write maybe some sentence prayers of praise and thanksgiving in the chat. Because as we gather today, we're not just watching a live stream. We're not just here for our enjoyment or our entertainment. We're here because this God that we worship is holy and mighty and majestic. So let's give him the praise today. Let's give him the glory that he deserves. Father God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, the greatest poet that has ever lived could not put into words how majestic you truly are. Lord, there are no words to describe your magnificence, and yet we thank you. We thank you, holy God, today that we get this opportunity to come into your presence. Even though for the majority of us, we're gathering by watching a screen, help us not lose the significance of this moment that we are gathered as your church, as your body, to worship you. Let's sing this chorus one more time together, church. And let's sing it with our whole heart today. Let's sing it coming to worship this awesome and majestic God. Lord, give us a glimpse of your glory today, we pray. In Jesus' name, here we are to worship. Well, we're going to watch our church news video now, which is going to tell us a little bit of the things which are coming up in the life of the church this week. Good morning and welcome to Hope Baptist Church. It's great to have you with us today for our online service. If you're new or visiting us or would like to get in touch with a member of the team, then can I encourage you to head to our website, www.hopebaptist.co.uk forward slash connect. If you fill in your details, a member of our team will be in touch with you. Starting next Sunday, we're launching an evening service at 7pm, which will be exclusively online. This is an experiment throughout the month of March to see how it goes. It'll be very different from our morning service. It'll be interactive. There'll be opportunity for discussion. We're going to be taking communion together and praying together too. We would love for you to join us for that. It's on a different platform that we haven't used before, so more information will be coming out about that over the course of the week, about how you can log on. But in the meantime, put it in your diaries, and we hope to see you there. We'd love to encourage you to be praying with us and for us for our new youth and children's pastor role that has now been advertised. It's going to be advertised over the next four weeks and if you could share this on social media or pass it on to someone who you think might suit the role, that would be great. Do be praying for this and a swim training advert that has now gone live. I'd love to share with you our connection points that we have created throughout the week to keep us connected as a church family throughout this lockdown. The new connection point to bring to your attention is the new Bible reading plan that will start next Tuesday. We are going to follow a 21-day plan together on the YouVersion Bible app uh, by Pete Greg called How to Pray. We think this will be great in the run-up to Easter. You can also join us as a church on Zoom on a Monday night to pray at 7 o'clock. We have live groups throughout the week as well as Hope Midweek on a Wednesday. On a Friday morning at 9.30 you can join us on Zoom to pray with us as a staff team. Please do what you can at this time to stay plugged in. 
Thank you once again for everyone who is giving generously to the work of the church at this time. If you'd like to know more about how you can give financially to Hope Baptist Church, simply go to www.hopebaptist.co.uk forward slash giving. Well, we're going to come around to the Word of God now. So if you've got a Bible with you, turn with me to the book of Luke. And we're going to be in chapter 8 today, beginning at verse 4. Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 4. And this is what it says. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell upon the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it. Some fell upon rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and he takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the words with joy when they hear it, but they have no roots. They believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, They are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, it will be taken away from them. Now Jesus, mother and brothers, came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowds. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word and put it into practice. I'm going to pray and and I'm going to invite John to come and speak to us this morning. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity once again to gather around your word. We thank you for the challenge, even that there is by simply reading it aloud. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that it's you that illuminates the word of God to us. Lord, cause our hearts and our ears to hear today, we pray. And not only hear, may we be people who act upon your words. Lord, your word tells us that those who don't act upon your words are like someone who looks at their reflection in a mirror, sees what needs to be changed and does nothing about it. Lord, we don't want to be people like that. We want to be open to your Holy Spirit his leading and his guiding. So come, Lord Jesus. Bless John as he speaks to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. John, over to you. Thank you, Luke. Put my microphone where it should be. Will somebody please wave at me if I start doing that? Right? I'm not used to holding on mic anymore. My theme this morning uh, from the parable uh, of of the the sower, as as it's called, is to ask the question, am I hearing the word of God? 
Uh, and from, from the reading, you, you will see that I've included uh, the two little extra bits to the parable um, at the end. That's uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the parable, the illustration of the light, the lamp put on the table, and also of the Jesus' mothers and brothers uh, wanting to talk to Jesus but couldn't get through. I put them there because those two, par two stories at the end of this talk of the parable of the seed, or the sower rather, in actual fact, it contains the same line that is repeated throughout the parable of the sower, which is, let those who have ears to hear, hear. So in other words, they, they, they all apply to the same basic thing. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> when you, you, you look at this, you, you see that uh, uh, Jesus was sharing with uh, his disciples and crowds were coming from all over the place. In fact, if you read Mark's gospel, it says that they were so scared that Jesus would be trampled that, that they put him in a boat and they, he went out to sea to, to address them. But the crowds were coming uh, to, 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 to hear uh, Jesus. <clears throat> Um, and if you read Luke 8 and verse 8, you'll find that while he was saying these, this parable and these other sayings, it says, I'll give you a literal translation of Luke 8 and verse 8. It says, while he was saying all this, he kept calling out, literally shouting, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So when you read the parable through, as Luke has just done uh, there for us, it interjected between those lines at each point, Jesus stopped, raised his voice louder than he was when talking to folk and addressed the crowd and says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, there's an element, I don't know whether it's frustration, but anyway, he, he, he wanted them to hear. In other words, Jesus, as, as, as Mark, again, as Mark records, uh, that when, when they came together, Jesus knew that they had come to see his miracles. That's why they were gathering. They were pressing in. They wanted the, the news of this miracle maker and this, this sort of great uh, uh, teacher uh, was going out. And the folk came and said, we're going to see this. And they, they came to see him. <clears throat> and, and he knew that... Many, or maybe even the majority, they had ears, they were listening to what he was saying, but they weren't actually hearing what he was saying. And I can't help thinking, sorry, this is just a bit of my quirky background, but I, I can't help but thinking of, of what a guy called Alan Greenspan said. He was the chair of the United States Federal uh, Bank, or Federal Reserve, in, from 1987 to 2006. And he said to a congressional hearing who were challenging what he was trying to do for the economy in America, and I think it's very appropriate to this parable, this parable's here. This is what he said to them after they had fired their questions at him. He, and it's all recorded for us. He says, I know you think you understand what you thought I said. But I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I, well, not what I meant. In other words, he was speaking, but they weren't getting it. And this is what this passage is all about. People hearing, but not actually getting what Jesus was saying. And so in Luke, in Luke 8 and verse 4, we, we read that this large crowd had gathered, people are streaming in to hear. It's a vast crowd. It's a huge crowd. And if you read Mark 3, I always think it's good to compare the Gospels because they're, they're different people's perspective on what happened. But Mark, he records for us what Peter, this is Peter's personal remembrance of, of, of all of this. He was the one closest, one of those closest to Jesus. Uh, and, and in there, it, it, it records there, I love this, about when Jesus' mothers and brothers and mother and brothers were coming. It's in, in, in Mark 3, it says that Mary and Jesus' brothers were trying to speak to Jesus because they thought he was mad. So you've got that lovely insight there of this interplay that's going on in, in the family there. Uh, they thought he was mad. And when he had finished, the crowd simply dispersed. They all went away, and all that were left were his disciples, 12, plus a, a, another sort of group of people. We're not told how many, but a, a, a significant number of people. And when, uh, when they gathered together... They come to Jesus and, and they say to him, here in Luke, he says, why do you speak in parables all the time? Why do you speak in parables? Why don't you just speak plainly? In the other Gospels, in Mark and Luke, uh, Mark and Matthew, they actually ask, 
what did you actually mean when you said that? So in other words, these guys got it. But it's, it's Jesus' reply to this question that I find is quite staggering. In Luke 8, verse 9 and 10, we read this. The knowledge, this is what Jesus says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God had been given to you. But to others, I speak in parables so that, and he quotes uh, Isaiah chapter 6, which is a, a, some words of judgment from God through the prophet Isaiah on a people who have been stubbornly refusing to hear God. And in Isaiah 6, this is what he said. This is what Isaiah said, and Jesus applies it to hear. Though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. And if you read Matthew and Mark, they add the next verse of, of Isaiah 9, which says, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They barely hear with their ears. They barely see with their eyes, and they barely understand with their hearts and turn that I would heal them. That was Jesus' explanation of the, this, this uh, question, why do you speak in parables? Well, we can say it was twofold. One, it was an act of judgment. It was an act of judgment. And that's, you know, I'm doing this so that they, they won't understand because they don't want to understand, they don't listen. But on the other hand, it was a mark of grace. Because there were some who did understand. And they are here identified as those who come along and say, can you say that again, Jesus? We didn't quite get what you said on what you meant. I wonder, my friends, does that describe you? When you read the Bible, when you hear the word of God, whether it's preached or, or whatever. Is that you? You see, in the parables... There's always a, a little enigma in the parables that seem to suggest this isn't what you think you're hearing. This is about something else. Now, for, for instance, in the parable of the lost sheep, and he says to farmers, which of you, having a hundred sheep, finds that one of them has wandered off? Or which of you wouldn't leave the 99 and go and find the one? And there isn't a shepherd in the world that said, oh, of course. They say, you're off your rocket. <laughs> We're not going to abandon 99 sheep to go looking for one stupid one. And of course, the point of that parable is, Jesus did, or God did. It's speaking of God's outrageous determination to reach just the one. There are several others. For instance, the prodigal son. There you've got the ungrateful, inheritance-squandering, immoral, pig-contaminated son, and he's joyously welcomed back and preferred over his seemingly righteous brother. And everything in you says, hang on, that's not fair. And yet again, what's it pointing to? God's outrageous grace. It doesn't add up, but God says, I've done it in any case. I've loved you even though you despise me. What about the, the dishonest servant who's apparently honored for defrauding his employer? I want to say, call the cops. <laughs> but, but no, it's used as, as the, uh, as in a way to make folks say, what are you saying? And of course, if they ask him, he would tell you, but I'm not preaching on, on that one today. But the last one, I illustration, we've got the rough sleeper who's invited to a wedding feast, but he refuses the gift of new clothing. You know, it, you ask any rough sleeper in the town, would you refuse a new set of clothes? <laughs> you know, the answer is absolutely not. But here the sower, he's, he's being uncharacteristically careless in allowing fast-growing, life-sapping, thorn-laden bushes to grow in his field. Because that's what he's got here. I know it says some of the seed landing on the path, and, and that was hard. And some of the, some of the seed fell on, on rocky soil. We'll come to that in a minute. But, but, but oh, overall, it's, it's, he, you know, he, he's, he's saying here that, that, that this, this farmer is just throwing the blooming seed out. Uh, and, and everything about it says, oh, hang on, Jesus. Gonna, I can't see a farmer doing it. We know that a little bit of seed would go, but... He would have at least dug his field and got the weeds out 
before he started sowing seed. No, no farmer, I, I love gardening. I, I, I don't plant into my weed seed, weeds. I, I clear my weeds out and get rid of them. I'll compost them, right? That's all they're good for. But you see, everything that you read in this screams out, what on earth is going on here? What on earth is going on here? And so the disciples come and they say, what is going on here? Explain it to us, Jesus. And Jesus immediately tells them what it's about. And he tells them that it's not the story about the sower. It's not even a story about the seed. He said, it's the story of the soil. And he says, the soil is a metaphor for your hearts. The soil is a description of your hearts. Soil that's been prepared and willing and eager and able to receive the word of God. The seed is the word of God. And he then proceeds to present everybody that's alive and are able to hear the word of God. He presents them under four classes of people and their response to the word of God. So as I said, it's not a parable about the sower or ultimately the, 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 the fields, but it's about the, the soil, their hearts. And your, your, your responsibility when you hear the word of God is to ask yourself, what is my heart attitude to what you're saying, God? It's about how you respond, how you are responding to God's word right now when you hear it and when you read it. And let's just quickly go through those four scenarios before I apply what I believe Jesus is saying about this hearing. The first group of people, he says, are, are those who simply hear the word, but their hearts, and by that scripture always means their desires, their emotions, are described as that well-worn, sun-baked path, hard as nails. There's no way for the seed, the word of God, to penetrate it. No way for the seed to influence it or change them. So the seed, the word, gets either crushed underfoot or bird-like, the evil one snatches them away, the seeds away, so that, as in verse 12 of chapter 8, it says, so that they cannot believe or be saved. By saved there it means be changed, affected. Here's a heart hardened by the knocks of life, by bitter experience, or perhaps even of arrogant self-belief. It's the I do it my way on the highway sort of guy who really has no place for God, who says my mind's made up, don't confuse me with facts. I'm happy as I am. And my friend, if that's you, then this morning I pray with all the heart and grace and love in the world that God makes you unhappy so you might even begin to listen to what he actually says but the second group of people is in verses 6 and also in verse 13 because you've got the parable and then Jesus explanation of it in in the the, the second verse there, there's the seed it fell on the rock and that that doesn't picture soil that's rocky because farmers will pick the rocks out of the soil when they plow it refers to the bedrock. Uh, it, it pictures those places in the terrain where you have a, a seam of bedrock that's just inches below the surface. It was very common in Galilee. In fact, you can't find much soil <laughs> in that area. There isn't something like that. But seed sown there would have the initial advantage of warmer soil. And it would quickly sprout and it would quickly begin to grow. But because there was no depth to the soil it would equally as quickly dry out and die because it just cannot live. And here Jesus' interpretation of this is found in verse 13. He says, yes, they, they receive it with lots of initial joy and enthusiasm. But because they have no depth, they fall away. Yes, my friends, there's lots to be, as it were, excited about and joyful about in the gospel. But 
I would say woe to the preacher and woe to the hearer that sugarcoats the gospel to make it sound as if God's saying, come to me and everything will be all right all the time. Because we know that that is simply not true. Everything is not fun when you come to faith in Jesus. And such a person who thinks that that's true, he comes to, to faith and then suddenly finds that people don't like him. Then finds that he's, he's got difficult choices to make. And when that happens, he quickly falls away. In other words, he's not prepared to face the cost and the consequences. And if you consider in the scripture the many times that Jesus warned his disciples, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. He was honest, wasn't he, with them? All the way through, Jesus was honest. Some of you are going to die. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but that's, that's what he was saying to him. But these people hear it, they quickly accept it, but then the cost becomes too great. And they fall away. And Jesus even went as far as to saying that following me might include splitting your family, losing friends, losing employment. Do you remember that when Jesus sent Ananias to baptize Paul and to pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit, he was to tell him how much he was to suffer for my name. I thought, great, welcome to the club, Jesus. Welcome to the club, Paul. God's got great things for you. Boy, are you going to suffer. <laughs> Peter writing to the church at large in 1 Peter 5 says, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. But it's after. Or we might even say through. Such things, the difficulties in, in the life of a believer, uh, are they designed to restore and confirm and strengthen to establish? The genuine believer is made strong by them. He's made firmer in his faith. I always remember when training as a prison governor, uh, Sir Monty Finiston was the, the, the guy who was the head of the management studies. Uh, and he turned around and said to us, he said, do you realize where I've made all of my greatest advances, uh, advances in management? And we said, no. He says, by all the screw-ups I made. <laughs> in other words, I learned. We, we screw up. We have difficulties. And through it, somehow God strengthens us. But this person doesn't recognize that, doesn't acknowledge it, doesn't see it. And so just in, it, for this one, never forget, my friends, never forget that excitement and enthusiasm, though great to see, is not necessarily evidence of real faith. You can all, even now, perhaps be thinking of somebody you know who seemed to accept the gospel, come to faith, and for a while was going great guns, and then suddenly, gone, fallen away, no longer following In history, far too many people have been immediately acclaimed as remarkable ex examples of conversion, especially if they're a celebrity, and often with tragic results. The third group, these are those where the seed fell amongst these thorns that I spoke of earlier. The thorns have perhaps been cut down, but they'd not been eradicated. And so the seed went into the soil and it began to grow, but so did the thorns. But thorns, the Cuba plant, that's what he's referring to, the Cuba thorn, right? So the thorn that they made Jesus around his head, uh, that's the Cuba plant. The Cuba grows phenomenally quickly. It grows up to two meters tall and it's very bushy. Just imagine a puny little seed of wheat. It wouldn't have a chance. And it dies because it loses its sustenance, it loses light, and it can't, it can't grow. And so Jesus says of these people, as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries, by riches, and by pleasure. And Matthew 
who was actually there when Jesus said these things, records Jesus' words in Matthew 13 and verse 15. And he identifies these things, these th things that hold him back and cause them to fall away. He says, they are the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches that are choking them to death. And Jesus is clear. You can't serve God and the world. You can't serve God and money. Anything you love more than God becomes an idol and takes you away from God. And we've all seen such folk. It breaks our hearts when they don't listen, when we find, and we find no consolation in being proved right, when their last estate is worse than their first. They won't listen to godly wisdom, and they get enticed by the suggestion that they can do such and such and, uh, uh, in their walk with God, and it won't affect their walk with God. And, of course, it does affect their walk with God. They're so besotted by this life that they lose sight of the fact that compared with eternity, this life is infinitely short. Have you ever heard of Francis Chan? He's a great um, preacher uh, uh, from the States. He, he, uh, I was going to get the video, but I didn't know how to get it from there to there and to, to you guys at the back there. All right, but anyway, um, there's a video where, where he preaches, and he's, he says, <clears throat> he says, life for the believer is like a rope and he goes across the stage and he picks up a rope right and he starts walking across the stage and the rope it goes along and he's going up and down the stage and pulling this rope out and he said that's the believer and then he holds up the bit of rope and he says this little bit with the red tape on this is the whole of your life on earth which is more important this or this these folk just don't get that they think here is what we're living for here is what's most important I'm not saying it's not important but they think it's most important and they get distracted by those and say well this has got to come first the mortgage has got to come first the education has got to come first a house has got to come first you know, a new car has got to come first or holidays every year has got to come first but otherwise our children will feel that they've been left out my employment promotion's got to come first. And those things swamp them. And their end result is that they fall away or they're screwed up. I always remember that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. But fourthly, and this is the main one, in Luke 8 and verse 8 and then verse 15, we're told that the seed that fell on the good soil stands for those with a noble and a good heart who hear the word and retain it and by persevering produce a good crop. And Luke says up to 100%. That's good multiplication. And so if we apply this, my friend, all those, those four illustrations... These parables serve as both an encouragement to Jesus' followers and a warning to his hearers. The encouragement is that when we see people respond superficially and subsequently fall away, we should not be too discouraged because even Jesus faced the same. I'm always encouraged when I read this that sometimes when you're preaching, you're looking at folk and you can see in their eyes they're not getting what you're saying. At least I can turn around and say, well, it, it probably is my inability to explain it. But it could possibly be just like Jesus. You know, they don't want to hear it. But the warning is that those who hear the parable and fall away are those in which ultimately there is no faith at all. And I want to ask you this morning, from the bottom of my heart, how do you hear the word of God? And then Jesus goes on in his explanation and he says, those who hear this word and retain it in their hearts, he says, those are the ones who, by perseverance, produce a great crop fundamentally my friends the only 
outward expression of your faith that can be measured is by the amount of fruit that comes from the faith that you profess. I'll say that again. Ultimately, the only part of your faith that can be measured is the fruit that that faith produces in your life. The good crop. True faith results in perseverance. It might be, and that faith might produce a fruit that's 20%, 30%, 50%, or even 100%, but never 0%. There's a great commentary on, on uh, Luke it's by Daniel Brock. It's in the IVP series, and he says this. Faith saves. <clears throat> the absence of faith does not. So to believe for a time and not to believe in a commendable way Since the end result is not faith. So to, so to believe for a time and not to believe in a commendable way, in the end result, it's not faith. One cannot end up unbelieving and have faith that saves. Because if so, salvation will come through unbelief. You see, faith if it is genuine, this is what Jesus is talking about. Faith if it's genuine is permanent, and our problems lay in the fact that we tend to view it as a response to the moment. How many times do we say, and how many times do we hear somebody say, well, how's so-and-so going? Oh, he, uh, he's not walking with the Lord at the moment. Ah, oh, but he gave his heart to Jesus when he was six. As if that is a comfort. That is no comfort at all. Because Jesus says, if the seed is received, it will grow in a life. Some faster than others, yes. Some more than others, yes. But it will grow. It won't cease to be. Faith saves. The absence of faith does not. Um, my friends, to, to emotionally protect ourselves, you know, we do reason that, well, they once believed. But Jesus doesn't say here, once believe. He doesn't say they once heard. He says they are hearing. Those who, 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 who listen to me and are saved, as it were, are those who are hearing my word. Hearing. Constant tense. Present tense. Faith, true faith is not based on having believed but on believing. And this might be simplistic, but it's as close as I can get to a parable. A baby lives because it, the baby does not live because it took a breath. It lives because it's still breathing. And based on this understanding, when facing temporary faith in the early church, they were clear. For instance, in 1 John 2 and verse 19, this is what they said. They, he says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they were never part of us. See, they understood that. That's not a callous statement. That's an honest statement. I'd rather be honest with somebody because it means I'm not going to fool them into thinking, oh, it's all right. And I believe that this morning the concluding questions for us all to consider is where is our heart now? You've heard the words, but have you heard what was being said? Is your heart, as Jesus describes it, good and noble in which the seed of faith produces a rich harvest? From my perspective, and it's a very limited one, I accept that. I'm just one individual. But from my perspective, as, as a preacher of four decades and more, my heartache is when I see folk who, who I have seen respond to the word of God, and I go and meet them, and it's obvious that they're not in the same universe as God anymore. It breaks my heart. And I've learned to have the courage of my own convictions and tell them, you are totally nullifying anything you had before.
second thing in question to consider is you do have ears to hear, but are you hearing? Are you heeding God's word right now? Are you hearing and heeding God's word right now? Maybe God has told you to do something. Well, in heaven's name, go and do it. God has told you to leave something off. Well, for everybody's sake, especially yours, stop doing it. You have ears to hear, so show that you're hearing. Respond to that word. And unless you fall into the category of that third group of people, ask yourself this question. Are you trying to mold your faith around your life or molding your life around your faith? There's a vast difference between the two. Rationalizing your faith so that it fits with your life rather than changing your life in order that it fits your faith. Now, I'm not talking about legalism now. I'm talking about the heart. There are some stuck-up prudes out there who would go around and boast how much they've changed and given up for God. Well, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Pray for them, that God would open their eyes to their own stupidity. But my friends, it's downright tragic, isn't it? When folk hear the word of God appear to change, and then later on, the, worst state, the end state is worse than the first. Are you molding your face around your life or molding your life around your face? And some, just to clear this up, because some of you know my history. They say, John, do you not preach once saved, always saved? You can't lose your salvation. Have you changed your mind? Absolutely not. I have not changed my mind. Because I never said, if you, you know, once you're saved, you can do what you want. What I've always tried to say is that those who truly are saved will endure. They might stumble, they might fall, they might fall a long way, they might collapse into a heap. But the call of God in their heart draws them back. I'm saying once saved, always saved, yes. But once saved, you will endure. You will go on. You will grow. My friends, this morning, please hear my heart speaking. Hear my heart. I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but I want to ask, is your life now? You've walked with the Lord for I don't know how many decades. But does that life still have the same life and light and joy and enthusiasm and determination in it as it had at the first? If not, why not? Jesus this morning is saying to you, screaming to you, not me, Jesus is screaming to you. He who has ears to hear, if you have ears to hear, then says Jesus in heaven's name, hear what I'm saying. And walk with me and spend eternity with me. Father, grant this, please, that we may be those who are hearers, not simply of words, but hearers of what you're actually saying. Mold and shape our hearts, Lord. Let them be good and noble, Father, please, that receive your word, take it into itself, that it produces life and fruit in much abundance. Do this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite the band to come back up. Thank you, John, for a challenging message to all of us this morning. And as we respond, because the word of God does demand a response. This is not a time to switch off, but this is a time to press in. And I wonder what it is that God has been speaking to you about recently, which you have been putting off. I wonder where God has been telling you to step up where you have decided not to. 
I wonder where God has been telling you to press in even though it's hard and you have been resisting. I wonder who God has been telling you to bless but you have just found it too hard to even consider it. You know, revival starts with the people of God taking small steps of obedience. Doesn't have to be major things. It's about listening to God and taking the next step. Listening to God and taking the next step. Listening to God and taking the next step. What is that step that God is calling you to take today? Maybe you're watching this and you're not a Christian. And you're hearing God's voice, maybe for the first time today, calling you. If you are, don't resist that call. But open your heart today. And say, God, here I am. The promise of scripture is that if anyone opens himself up to Jesus, he will come in. So, Father God, as we worship you now in song, will you be speaking to your people? Will you give your people, Lord God, the the energy, the ability, the enthusiasm to take that next step, even when we find it hard? And Lord, if there is anyone watching this right now who does not know you, may they hear your voice telling them today that today is the day of salvation. You know, the Bible says, seek the Lord while he is there to be found. Draw on him while he is near. You can know this Jesus for yourself today. I want to encourage you as we sing. If you believe God is calling you into a step of obedience, in whatever that might look like, whether that is simply pressing into the body once again, even though we're apart, whether that is to bless someone, to pray for someone, whatever that step of obedience is for you today, I don't know what it is. But what I do know is the Bible tells us that as iron sharpens iron, we sharpen each other. So I want to encourage you today to do a brave thing and to write in the chat what you believe God might be saying to you today, that we as a church might be able to lovingly support you and encourage you and challenge you to step out and to step into what Jesus did. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we as a church were to do this today and to write what we believe God was telling us to do this week and when we gather together next week, to be able to share testimonies of the goodness and the grace of God over this week and the way he has moved in our life. You know, if revival does start with us as the church taking small acts of obedience when we hear the voice of God, let's commit this week to taking small acts of obedience when we hear the voice of God in Jesus' name. Let's worship and let's encourage us and each other with what we believe God is speaking to us about right now. But let's not just be hearers of the words, let's be doers also. Let's worship church. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am.
together this morning to a close let's come to the Lord in prayer together the Bible tells us to cast all of our cares upon him for he cares for us so let's commit ourselves our church our nation, our world to our awesome God today I want to encourage you, if you've got any prayer requests this morning, I'd love to pray for you. I have Facebook open in front of me, so do write your prayer requests into the chat. And if I see them, I'll pray. And we can all say amen with you this morning. Let's pray together, church. Father God, the challenge for us today is simple, to be hearers of your word, and doers of your word, and not just hearers. But Lord, give us ears to truly hear what you're saying, we pray. We're tired of just religious rhetoric. We don't want to go through the motions, Lord God, when it comes to you. But we want to seek your face. So, Lord God, this week I pray for all of those who are associated with Hope Baptist Church. Lord, you know their situations. You know the circumstances that they're going through right now. You know those that have job interviews coming up, Lord God. You know those within our family who are sick and in need of a miraculous touch from you. Lord God, will you meet your people at their point of need this week, we pray. Help us in a season of distance, Lord God, to truly be the church, even though we can't gather. Help us, Lord God, to be your hands and your feet to a world which so desperately needs you. We thank you, Lord God, for this city that you put us into, Lord God, that we are in Plymouth. We thank you, Lord God, for your church in this city, not just this congregation, but your church across this city. We thank you, Lord God, that there is an expression of the gospel here, and we long to see more and more of that, Lord God. Strengthen your church, Lord God. Give us fresh ideas fresh enthusiasm for mission, Lord God, and to reach out. Help us, Lord God, not be averse to change where you call us to change. Help us, Lord God, to hear your voice and take those steps of obedience. Lord God, this morning we pray with Jean, for Mel and Neil, for Nikki, for Paul, for Chloe, and for Hope. We thank you, Lord God, for who they are, Lord God, and for the part they play in this family. Lord, it grieves our heart that we haven't been able to see them properly for so long in the flesh. But we pray your abundant blessing upon them this day. Lord, we pray uh, with Katie for the announcement tomorrow. Lord, this lockdown is so difficult. We pray for wisdom for our government who are probably meeting today. We pray for 
the ease of restrictions at the right time, Lord God. And Lord God, we look forward to that day when we as a church are back together. But until then, keep us pressing on and pressing into you. Lord, we pray that as we do emerge from this lockdown, that we'll be able to look back and we'll be able to see how you have moved in our lives and what you've been doing in the midst of it. We thank you, Lord God, that you are faithful all along, even when we don't see it. And Lord God, with the announcement of lockdown and whatever's happening in this country coming tomorrow, we do pray for our world. And Lord God, I pray particularly for the poorer countries of this world who are not blessed with the vaccine in the same way as maybe we are. Help us as a country not to hoard but to be generous. And Lord, not just to give out of our surplus, but to give out of our abundance. Lord God, help us to be generous now to the last, the least, and the lost of this world who so desperately need you. We pray, Lord God, for this project that we're sponsoring in Ghana. We pray for the mothers and the babies who are gonna be touched by that project. We pray, Lord God, that we will uh, hear stories of testimony and blessing as a result of that. Lord, we pray with June this morning for Charlotte, for Richard and for Evelyn, that they will find strength, Lord, together. What I'd like to do now, church, I'd like us to say the Lord's Prayer together. And I understand that we're not in a building and we can't hear one another, but don't let that stop you from lifting your voice in prayer this morning. Let's say this prayer together, even though we're separated as a sign of our unity as we close our time together today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to close our service together now with one last song. Let's worship together with our voices one last time. If you're able to, there's an invite for you today to join the church for Zoom coffee. The link will be put into the chat on Facebook and YouTube. So do join to see one another, to encourage one another, and to say hello. But until we meet again, we look forward to seeing you across this week at our Hope Midweek, at our prayer meetings, at other events going on. Be blessed, look to Jesus, listen to his voice, and really hear it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship God in song one last time as we close.